10 o'clock. So, <laughs> excellent. So everybody that's on probably heard the note that we're, we're recording. Uh, so I hope that's all right with everybody. Folks are still jumping on, so let's give them another couple of minutes to get connected. In the meantime, let me ask those of you who are already on, if you would go ahead and put in the chat um, who you are, what your partnership is, and it would be great if you could put um, why you're interested in uh, apprenticeship. You know, that maybe you're just starting one, maybe you've been doing it for a long time and want to be part of the discussion, whatever it happens to be. Um, that would help us as we um, think about how to, uh, as our panelists particularly think about how to um, uh, give you the best information that they have to help you in your work. Great. And we've, we're going to, we're expecting a pretty good sized crowd today. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, select um, speaker view on my screen. Uh, you all may want to do that. It might help us uh, figure out who's speaking at any given time. Um, but we'll leave it fairly broad. It's up to you if you want to use speaker view or gallery view. And just give folks another couple of minutes to go. All right. Thanks to everybody for joining us to have this discussion. Um, we want it to be really interactive today. So we'll be asking you to put your questions in the chat uh, and uh, we also acknowledge that many of you have expertise in this area uh, as well. And so if you've got a comment or can help answer a question, uh, jump in. Um, so we want to keep it um, as open as we possibly can. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, again, we're, we're recording. So if anybody has a challenge with that, let us know. Um, our tech is being run by uh, Karina Camacho, our wonderful graduate uh, student researcher. And uh, she's also being supported by Andrew Yeager, um, our, our, another of our graduate student researchers with the HRTP program at uh, UC Berkeley. So thanks, thanks to them for that work. If you need any support, um, please uh, communicate with them in the chat and we'll see what we can do to help. Okay, great. So welcome to our HRTP community webinar on apprenticeship uh, strategies and issues for high road training partnerships. Everybody knows this is a really broad topic uh, and it's got you know a lot of technical, strategic, practical and political aspects, right? That we all may be thinking about. Um, and the breadth of apprenticeship itself is huge. In fiscal year 2020, for example, there were over 100,000 active apprentices in California alone in over 1,100, 1,179 programs and 111 programs that were new in fiscal year 2020. Um, and in addition to that, the projects of under the HRTP initiative, all of your projects, are in a range of stages in how you use apprenticeship. Um, some of you have been using apprenticeship and certainly pre-apprenticeship models for a long time and have significant expertise in the area. Um, others are just now exploring whether apprenticeship makes sense for your sectors and for the occupations uh, that you're serving. Um, and for the past couple of decades, I don't know, John, a uh, couple of decades or so, uh, let me know if, if you think my timeline's off. Um, the national workforce system uh, has been really trying to capture the secret sauce. You know, what, it, what is it that has made traditional apprenticeship, the, the kinds of construction apprenticeships, for example, that we think of, um, uh, and certainly uh, and pre-apprenticeship a success, right? Because these have been some of the best and most highly successful workforce programs uh, the nation's ever seen, or even uh, uh, certainly the experience of other countries for uh, hundreds of years now. Um, and and tr we've been trying to translate that as a workforce system for other sectors and occupations. Um, and we can do that well, or we can do that poorly, I think, if depending on how deeply we understand why these models are so effective. I think a lot of that secret sauce has to do with job quality, uh, demand focus, you know, starting with the jobs that exist and the high quality jobs that exist, um, and worker wisdom, right? Workers are really embedded in those traditional models. Um, and all of those are central, central pr principles of high road training partnerships. So there really is a lot um, of, of uh, synergy at the nexus of high road partnerships and apprenticeship. 
So today what we want to do is start a dialogue with all of you about apprenticeship as a high road strategy. Um, as I said at the top, we want this to be a highly interactive session. So we're going to use um, a, a kind of a hybrid Q&A approach. Um, uh, instead of just putting stack in the chat, if you want to ask a question, we'll ask you to note kind of the topic of your question or sort of briefly note your question. Um, and then at several points throughout the session today, um, we will um, have Q&A uh, opportunities. Um, at the Q&A intervals, uh, Andrew Yeager is going to call on you in order uh, to go ahead and ask your question. Um, and then we'll ask our panelists to respond or other experts in the group uh, to respond as well. Uh, because we know, again, that many of you also have deep experience in this apprenticeship. Uh, so if you want to comment or contribute, jump right in. Um, so we're going to begin with overviews from three practitioners who are really at the nexus of high road work and apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship. Rebecca Hansen, who's the executive director of the Ed Fund uh, in the healthcare space, and also is the chairperson of the California Interagency Advisory Commission uh, on Apprenticeship, or Committee on Apprenticeship, I should say. Uh, and John Brower, who uh, is the executive director of the Workforce and Economic Development Program at the California AFL CIO, you know, again, really connected in the labor space uh, with apprenticeship uh, and the community space around apprenticeship. And Mark Cowan, and Mark, uh, many of you know, is, is a f high road field specialist with the California Workforce Development Board, high roads field branch, with really deep connections into the building trades and into pre-apprenticeship. So I think that's a great sort of panel that really demonstrates what that nexus between high road and apprenticeship looks like. Um, so as you listen, they're going to start with some over, overview presentations, kind of giving you a sense of where they come from in, in this space. Um, as you listen to their presentations, go ahead and note your questions in the chat. Um, and then once we've heard some overviews from our panelists, we're going to jump into three um, what we've identified as topic areas that we think are important to talk about um, in both practice and strategy. Uh, the first will be navigating the players and roles in apprenticeship, kind of what's the universe like and how do we think about that? Who are they? Um, the second subtopic area will be apprenticeship on, on a career pathway or apprenticeship as a career pathway strategy. Um, and the third topic area is going to be when is apprenticeship the right tool or maybe not the right tool, right? And in each of those subtopics, you'll have an opportunity to answer questions and have dialogue, okay? So now you get to now get, stop listening to me as a talking head, and I'm going to ask um, Rebecca to get us started. Rebecca Hansen, uh, as you all know, I think is from one of the leading non-traditional apprenticeship programs and sectors in the country that is in healthcare. Um, I was just looking, Rebecca, at the those fiscal 2020 sta uh, apprenticeship state uh, statistics, and I noted that of the top 30 occupations of active active apprentices by volume all except a few were in what we consider traditional occupations. And th it, those two key exceptions were in healthcare, in the nurse assistant and pharmacy support tech roles. So I think uh, Rebecca really um, uh, is at the cutting edge of what's going on in apprenticeship and not, uh, particularly non-traditional apprenticeship. So uh, Rebecca, take it away. Thank you, Pam. Um, and just at the front of this, I wanna acknowledge, cause we have a bunch of um, folks on this call um, who are working with other HRTPs at this point who really have been a, a deep part of the, um, the work um, of the Education Fund. You know, Elizabeth Toops, who's on with a former executive director who I started working with as a consultant to look at apprenticeship before I joined the fund and, and she moved on to do this work with JBS, um, as well as Michael Kushner, who was also a leader in this work. And especially, I just wanna shout out um, to Scott Goodell, who I believe is on, who really is the deep person who really understands how this work is done on the ground, nuts and bolts. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm going to give a sort of a high level presentation. And then as we get into discussion, I'm hoping, um, you know, Scott, as well as um, Tariq Scott, who's currently um, helping lead this work at the Ed Fund, can dive into on nuts and bolts as they come up. So um, with that, if you go to the next slide. Um, Okay, so um, folks probably know this, the Education Fund is a, a multi-employer labor management training fund, 100,000 allied health workers across six SEAU locals and 17 employers um, in mostly the acute care, largely private sector healthcare. 
Um, we deliver comprehensive education training programs, um, career technical education, preparatory continuing education, um, and registered apprenticeships. Um, and just to give you a sense of the scale, you know, Pam, you talked about this, like our apprenticeship work is definitely um, small scale, right? It's, it's, it's very, um, you know, uh, it's very difficult to build this in our sector. And I would say that while we do a lot of apprentice-like work, um, we've, um, and we'll talk about it, like the um, overall 22,000 learners year to date in 2021, which is our biggest year that we've ever had so far, um, and only 72 of those um, are in apprenticeship. That said, I think one of the unique things, if you go to the next slide, is that we do have eight occupations we're currently training um, apprentices in. And so, um, you know, we'll get into sort of like why apprenticeship, when apprenticeship, um, but I would say that, uh, you know, we've had 73 in the past and five occupations since 2016. And then this year we've had 72 who are in, um, eight different occupations. So a lot of small cohorts um, with the exception of vision services assistant, which is sort of a, a larger scale project for us with 32 apprentices. If you go to the next slide. Um, so the benefits of apprenticeship, you know, I think folks know this, but just to sort of um, share our perspective on it, we're really about, uh, our program is really about creating career pathways into higher paying, higher skilled jobs for incumbent workers. Our, our, the focus of our training program is, is the incumbent workforce. Um, and for many of those workers, it's really important. Um, they won't necessarily be able to pursue career advancement unless they're able to continue um, with their full salary and even increasing salary throughout the apprenticeship um, in order to move into that job. Um, we also um, uh, really value the model of having precepting and, and mentor support, as well as obviously the focus of the program for the worker is earning um, a new industry recognized credential. And for employers, um, I think the, the key benefits are um, being able to both recruit and develop a highly skilled workforce. I don't know if we have folks on from um, SEIU 1000, but when they've done LVN to RN, it just actually solves a staffing problem in, um, that they've had where, yeah, we can give you the slide. Somebody asked if they can see it. Um, you know, that it really does help with recruitment, um, broadly speaking, because people want to work at, with an employer. We've seen a lot of news lately, right, about how, like, employers are having to offer career paths in order to attract workers in this labor market. Um, and so I think, you know, there, for employers, it really does give them something very tangible to offer um, new recruits, as well as gives them an opportunity to really invest in developing a highly skilled workforce that precisely meets their needs because of the OGD component. Um, reduces their turnover costs, increases employee retention. Um, we've seen overall with our work that um, even just for any of the services that we offer, we've worked with Kaiser and Dignity to look at this, that we have a 50% reduction in turnover for anyone who uses any of our services. And for our apprentices in particular, um, we have 100% retention. Um, and again, it's like, this is a flexible model to meet industry needs. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, this is a photo of um, some of our CNA apprentices currently at um, El Camino Hospital um, in uh, Mountain View. Um, but just to say, um, you know, I don't want to repeat any of the things that we said on the last slide, but, um, you know, one of the advantages in doing these programs is we can add, um, you know, related technical instruction that goes beyond whatever the certification requirements are, because sometimes um, an employer has particular training needs that aren't necessarily the same as what can be offered through a regular career technical education program. Um, we provide all the tutoring, case management, wraparound services. Um, we use a competency-based model, which is pretty innovative. And I think, Pam, most of those existing apprentices that you see um, in the state um, are really a time-based model that is, you know, uh, you know, time proven and solid and all of that. But I think with um, incumbent worker training and training for um, healthcare positions, you know, competency-based model gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of ensuring that people are able to accelerate as quickly as they're able through a training program um, 
And, uh, you know, Scott Goodell can speak to this in the discussion probably, but we've done extensive training of preceptors. That's, that's a key component of, of the advantage um, that employers see in partnering with us in this work is that we're kind of solving for um, their capacity to train people at the same time that we're also supporting um, apprentices, we're supporting the development of preceptors. Um, and yeah, a, a lot of our work also is breeding together a variety of resources, private public funding, state and federal funding, as well as the employer monies. Go to the next slide. Just at a, I'll sort of wrap this up because I'm probably going too long, but just to say that, you know, just some examples of what we've done at Dignity Health. Um, we're now, I think, in our third cohort. So I think we've in total, we've had 30 coder apprenticeships, apprentices at Dignity Health so far. But it's really been, um, you know, the goal is both to fill gaps, but also fix what was a broken job, job ladder that Michael Kushner will remember discussing with Dignity back in 2015. But um, we've now actually solidified a job ladder and continue to have apprentices on an annual basis moving into, um, you know, higher level coding positions at Dignity. Go to the next slide. Um, this is, um, we'll show you a video a little bit later. Um, but this was an example of sterile processing apprenticeship, which is now in planning for its third cohort. And this program um, has a huge interest and demand. I think our first um, cohort that's pictured in here, we had you know, hundreds of applicants um, for just seven spots. Um, and that's very typical for us. Um, oh, great. Somebody else is using um, competency based. Um, and then finally, it's also just to fill the gap. There's like a gap often between um, education and um, doing the job. There's an on the job requirement um, of experience um, for many positions in healthcare. And so this is just an example of where um, we used an apprenticeship where we had um, you know, uh, incumbent workers who had already completed uh, surgical tech education certification, but needed um, uh, you know, an accelerated experience um, uh, in OJT in order to be able to actually place in the job. And, and that's very typical in healthcare that we see even after we support somebody completing their degree, that they don't immediately move into the job because they have an uh, experience requirement that can be anywhere for, from six months to two years um, that they're working to meet. And I think that might be it. I was just, that's sort of our high level of our current program, but um, yeah, I'll pass it back to Pam. That's great. Thanks, Rebecca. I think that's a really superb overview, particularly for people that are moving into that space. So I think um, I, we really appreciate that. Um, and you can never talk too long. We always, you always have great things to say. Thank you. Um, and speaking of people with great things to say, uh, let's go to John Brower. Uh, John, you've been in, in, you know, working on this for a, a really long time and really connected with the labor movements, um, work around apprenticeship, traditional apprenticeship, and I know non-traditional as well. Uh, can you give us an overview from your perspective? Sure. So I, I, the apprentice programs, I think you all should think about as one aspect of creating a high road training partnership. They're, they're frankly a means to the end of uh, your overall partnership. Uh, and I, you know, the, the big struggle that we have in the United States is that employers traditionally do not make an investment in their workers, uh, except in the, the, the building trades in, where we see uh, contractors and, and labor coming together to, to start with the jobs, as, as Rebecca said earlier, and, and, and Pam um, looks at the basic um, requirements of, of that work, and frankly does a couple of things. One is, that I think it's important to remember that apprenticeship is the apprentice program making an agreement with an apprentice, that they are agreeing to deliver a certain um, uh, education and training and work experience, and that that um, uh, apprentice is also committed to essentially um, undertaking that learning experience. You literally are signing an indenture agreement with the State Division of Apprenticeship Standards or with DOL to become a, a, a registered apprentice. You're, you're actually, uh, that's what indentured means in that equation. Um, uh, 
I think that the important piece of this, um, both for traditional and non-traditional, is it, it, it can do a lot of different things. One is it promotes the real professionalization of the work. And I think in a lot of areas, um, uh, much as we have started to do and you all have started to do with, with trying to get certificate credentials and degrees, becoming an apprentice uh, in whatever sector, including various parts of the service sector, actually is a big part of that, which then in turn adds to the dignity of that work. Uh, it is also a way to um, build um, another thing that Europe does very well with their apprenticeship that we only do with the building trades, which is have folks um, identify a calling, um, frankly. And, and that's not something we always kind of talk about, but, but that elsewhere in the world, apprenticeship really is a way for somebody, everything from bookkeeping and finance to medical to building trades, to engineering, to whatever, use apprenticeship to have young people in particular figure out um, a calling and, and kind of moving forward as a career. Um, I think uh, the opportunity here, and the, I think, I hope we get into the discussion, particularly on the career pathway piece is um, making sure that this works for both potentially incumbent workers, as, as Rebecca pointed out, folks moving up uh, or getting additional experience inside and the kind of access equity question where folks, uh, and I've got an example on, I saw Russell Anderson here from uh, California Transit Work, but on the transit side and, and medical and other where you need to get experience in some pretty complex stuff and apprenticeship is, is one model for doing that. So I, I think there's a lot of aspects of this, but I, I, I really wanna just, kind of get back to the basics of you're, you're really making an agreement with each other around the path, the career path and the training path that you're moving forward. This isn't just kind of a, a branding exercise, if you will. I think the other thing that I would kind of want to emphasize that Rebecca laid out in there is um, uh, the other piece that we're seeing, particularly in the stuff that we're doing in transit and and uh, in some other non-traditional um, is the whole thing around mentorship and helping particularly newer workers come in. So that preceptor piece that she was talking about in the medical arena, that ability to have, like you do in the building trades, a, a journey person or a journey worker, experienced worker, which frankly also helps your organization, the company or whomever, um, frankly, uh, uh, have a better esprit de corps and a professionalization. So those are just some initial things to think about. That's a really helpful sort of grounding, John, for all of us. I really love the, the the reminder to focus on the fact that this is an agreement. This is a uh, an agreement between the parties to 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 both uh, learn and to provide a meaningful education. And then, as you say, bringing in um, the whole workforce. Right? It's not just the apprentice and the maybe the apprentice instructor, but it's the whole workforce that kind of gets engaged in this thing, in these models. That's great. Thank you. Great. Well, let's let's now then turn to um, Mark Cowan. Uh, Mark, you know, you too have pretty deep experience and certainly in the building trades, um, but then also in really um, looking at pre-apprenticeship and the key issues around pre-apprenticeship. Can you give us an overview from your perspective, Mark? Absolutely. Thank you, Pam. Um, as Pam said, I'm a, a field specialist in the high road field team. I focus on the HRCC initiative. So I'll just explain what that is first before uh, providing my perspective. So HRC at its, at its most basic, it's, it's very similar to HRTP insofar as it engages the same um, high road elements like emphasizing things like partnership, worker voice, along with equity, um, quality jobs and being industry led and driven. The difference is that HRCC in this state is is that uh, every single one of them is tapping into a century old career pathway uh, that, that John has referred to and that's um, that's an apprenticeship program in the building trades. Uh, the goal of HRCC is to connect those folks who've been historically marginalized from the trades with with those those jobs uh, and the first step on that pathway is apprenticeship. So in a sense, it's kind of a, a career ladder to another career ladder. And this is kind of a clumsy metaphor that I came up with yesterday. Um, but I'm 
sure you've probably all saw one of those raised ladders like fixed to the side of a building like it could be at the bottom of a, a fire escape that you can you know kick down from above but you can't reach it from the ground in a sense that's what apprenticeship is like in the trades a lot of the time once you get up there the the only way is up as long as you, you keep moving and you're on a graduated pay scale if portable benefits for you and your family um, uh, paid for by an employer into a, into the trust or employers into a trust uh, you have a pension that works the same way uh, you reach training milestones that uh, that open you up to more opportunities the issue is getting to that first rung of the ladder that you can't quite reach from the ground so what do we do we make another ladder and that other ladder is hrcc uh, and we build that ladder by by addressing each of the historical the practical and the, the, the financial barriers to, to women, to people of color, to formerly incarcerated, to veterans, uh, all of the barriers that they face when, when seeking apprenticeship. And each of these barriers have to be addressed in turn. Uh, they need to vary region by region in response to the demands of any, any one particular area. But through partnership, through training and supportive services, they, they build a, a ladder to a ladder into the middle class. Um, so why stand up a whole system of HRCC around apprenticeship in the trades. Well, um, John referred to this in his opening re remarks. In workforce development, we, we talk a lot about the types of jobs that the economy is creating at the moment and how it's not producing enough sustainable jobs. Then we, we look back at times in history when it appeared to be, the economy did appear to be creating sustainable jobs that were needed uh, for, for example, the emergence of, of the middle class in America and how it was common in that period of time for employers to invest a good share of their profits back into their, their workforce to improve their productivity, to increase their retention rates, and so on. And that was their commercial strategy. It's how they stayed competitive, how they attracted and, and retained talent and got a good return on their investment for that talent. Um, but things began to, to shift in, in the late 70s. And a flashpoint in this uh, was the rise of the automotive industry in Japan and how American corporations reacted to this competition from abroad in a new and dynamic globalized economy. And uh, the American companies, they didn't think they could compete with their blue collar workforce. They were earning so much more than their Japanese counterparts that it, it just doesn't, it didn't pencil out. So they responded to that by reducing their labor costs uh, and following the popular economic uh, ideologies of the day and allowing the market to allocate resources and things like that. And they did that gradually by laying off workers and moving production overseas after the signing of NAFTA and so on. But it came to light in the 80s that the Americans didn't have the full picture of what Japanese automakers were doing. They weren't creating cheaper and more reliable cars at a greater scale than the Americans because their employees worked longer hours um, for lower wages. The Japanese were out competing the Americans because they were more productive and they were more productive because Japanese automakers were investing so much in the skills attainment of their workers. And they achieved that in part through, guess what, the use of apprenticeship or something very like it. So my perspective is that apprenticeship in the trades is kind of like a holdout of the old way of doing business in America. And it's flourished for over 100 years because it's competitive and it's adaptive. And I think it's, it's definitely underutilized in, in this country. Um, There's so many occupations uh, where it would make sense. And in the development of apprenticeship in those occupations, I think there's a lot to learn from, from the building trades. Back to you, Pam, that's, that's all I have to say. That's a lot. That's wonderful, Mark. Really exciting and a lot of support. I, or I see getting some support out there for your analogy. I think that was really helpful for all of us and really appreciate your framing um, some of the um, equity uh, uh, purposes and, and value that apprenticeship brings to the table. If you can build that first ladder that helps people get to the second ladder, right? So I really appreciate your keeping that uh, in front of us all. And also grounding us in that sort of notion of what it's about, what, what happens when you invest in workers uh, through these kinds of models and what happens when you don't. So thank you um, very much for that. So there's one question that I think was specific to one of the programs. We'll go ahead and jump into that. I think that was Michael uh, uh, Michael's question, if I can get up to that in my chat, because I'm being crazy. Uh, 
I can see it here. It's, and I think it was directed to me. It has, um, does your program allow people to enter mid-level, not from scratch, if they have existing experience, skills or experience? And I would say yes, and. So um, we, uh, and, and Scott worked on this, and maybe Michael did too, but um, we've definitely done programs where we were actually giving credit for prior learning and just doing the OJT component because we have so many members who are learners who have already completed the school and just need the OJT, that's all they need. And so we've been able to give credit for prior learning for that. The other experience we've had is that in many cases, there are people who've been stuck for a long time, right? And so um, like we did a coder apprenticeship at um, medical coder apprenticeship at Kaiser. And I think um, the average years of experience at Kaiser was 20 years. And there were at least two apprentices who had been working for over a decade towards um, becoming a medical coder and really like stuck, could not find how to reach the OGT um, experience requirement for the job. And so um, in that case, and also at, at Dignity with our coders, um, what we've done, most people in the program already earned certification at some point, but it might've been 10 years ago, it might've been two years ago, they might've just finished, like there's a whole range of, of how long it's been. So in most of those cases, we're doing some initial assessments. And this is why the competency base is important because some people are gonna need a little more help um, than others. But I think the idea is like that we really do wanna, um, and, and we don't wanna preclude someone from joining um, or from doing sort of refresh work. And then we're also adding RTI that's specific to how that job is currently done um, that they are, are moving into. So hopefully that's helpful. So it's sort of like, Yes, and we're also kind of um, building RTI and OGT that really does address any gaps because individual workers have different sort of uh, competencies that they're still working to meet. I don't know, Tariq or anybody. I, yeah, go ahead. I, Rebecca, just to build off that though, I, I hope that folks, as you're thinking about this, if you do decide, and we, I think we're gonna get to the, the back end on things to consider, but. I would not come in with a preconception of whether you're going to end up being competency based or time based or or hybrid. You really do need to start with sort of what the industry is needing, what the requirements may be, and or who the apprentices are. So you may end up uh, in a situation where the skill level requirements are such that people are going to want to have um, an experience beyond just the, the competency and the test. They're going to need it to get to something more advanced. Um, uh, as an example, um, and, and I saw Russell Anderson here, the mechanics maintenance on um, uh, electric vehicle systems, you have um, uh, 50 onboard computers and you'll have like something like 17 pieces of software. The service workers that you're trying to create that pathway from in the, that transit agency, they need that experience. And you, before apprenticeship, you couldn't get it. So just whatever model I think should be, you're gonna have some, some thinking about both how you're trying to respond to sort of what the, the industry demand and skills are and what who you're looking at as apprentices, whether they're incumbent who may have some experience and, and are more likely to have some competency-based ability to, to, to move up versus uh, maybe newer workers who are gonna need some something more time-based or hybrid or something, so. Really, really helpful to both of you. And, and other questions are starting to flow in, which is great. And I think some of them will get some beginning answers in our next set of discussions, but then we'll start to go through them in the stack mode and ask you to call out your questions specifically. But that was really helpful. Thank you. All right, so then let's go ahead and move move to this notion of um, uh, these topics in practice and strategy, starting with uh, kind of navigating the players and roles in apprenticeship. So I'm going to kick it back to Rebecca, um, who, who I think has got some good slides for us again. Thank you, Pam. Um, and I'm just going to do this super high level, but just to um, say, you know, we wanted to give you a sense of the role that we play versus um, our partners in these um, joint apprenticeship committee, as well as um, in the development and um, support of the programs. If you go to the next slide, um, you know, folks probably already know this, but the JAC provides the formal oversight of the program um, and it has voting members um, representing labor and management. 
Um, and it also has, we are as the education fund, a non-voting member, um, really working to um, support um, all aspects of, you know, administering and managing the program, the meeting agenda, tracking all the action items, really just helping make it work. Um, and the JAC oversees the design, implementation, um, and conclusion of the apprenticeships. We go to the next slide. Um, so just at a high level, um, again, the Ed Fund, um, we're really providing the leadership and the coordination for all aspects of the program and program management. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, the union worker and employer partners are really providing all the expertise on the vocational technical expertise related to the program development. Um, they are um, implementing a letter of agreement and coming to really clear terms at the start of, of who's doing what and what the commitments are through the program. Um, and also doing that in line with the CBA, the collective bargaining agreement. Um, and then um, they're also helping to lead recruitment and the guide the selection of apprentices. Um, so we go to the next slide. And then I'll just highlight a few additional employer um, roles. Our employers are providing obviously the locations and site um, for the OJT and sometimes also for the RTI. Um, they're providing backfill when needed when we have an incumbent worker moving up. They usually retain a right of return to their job. So there's backfill for the time they're in the program until they're solidly, um, until a certain time period passes um, after they place into the new job. Um, their employer is also um, IDing preceptors, OGT managers, and helping navigate significant issues related to HR. That's usually um, actually pretty significant. Like, um, just how people are coding their time, that they're continuing to earn their benefits, that kind of thing. So just to sort of share that at the high level. Um, and we'll make these slides available. There's more slides. We, we just sort of tried to narrow it down to a few things um, that we thought was helpful, but I'll stop there. Super helpful. Thank you. John, uh, Casey, do you have some comments that you want to want to throw in on players and roles in apprenticeship? Um, I, both there and maybe the, the pre for, for um, HRCC, but I, I do think that there is um, figuring out that agreement as to who is delivering um, the instruction, both the rela related and technical instruction and or um, uh, um, the, the on the job experience piece of it. Um, I know for us and the labor movement and the non-traditional and traditional um, the unions offer uh, oftentimes um, uh, older workers in particular who can become uh, instructors uh, in delivering that as well as mentors um, in that piece. Um, there is obviously a role related to, uh, and I think both they in particular can, can bring the industry demand and the industry knowledge side of things, as well as the employers. The, your sponsorship um, committee really should have a, a, a good reflection of um, the industry demand as well as the worker voice side. And so figuring out the composition of that and, and who's there is gonna be really important in, in that equation. Um, uh, those are some of the, the, the basic pieces out of it. I think the difficulty is often figuring out um, the role of say beyond the employers and labor um, uh, uh, what the, the, the educational institutions, community-based organizations, public agencies, and as you probably have figured out from your own HRTP, figuring out everybody's return on that investment for participating in your, your high road partnership. Same thing goes for the, um, the, the apprenticeship program itself, is what is everybody um, expecting to get out of it under that, not only their roles as Rebecca laid out in that agreement, but probably having a conversation about what everybody uh, wants to get out of creating that apprenticeship program and having clarity on it. Really, really helpful. And we're, we're getting um, a lot of questions coming in about uh, mentorship. And I think, um, <coughs> excuse me, when we get to the deeper um, Q&A session, maybe we can sort of dive into that, uh, how you do nuts and bolts of uh, mentorship and preceptorship. 
Um, and then also uh, getting questions around pre-apprenticeship. And uh, as Joyce Guy uh, points out, she, their team has a pre great pre-apprenticeship program. Mark, do you have some comments around roles and responsibilities as it relates to the pre-apprenticeship world? Sure, yeah. I, I spoke about it being a ladder and to continue that metaphor and make it even a bit more bizarre, maybe each, each rung of that ladder consists of uh, sort of a different uh, unique value add that a partner can bring to the table, like whether they're in charge of the, the outreach or the case management or the delivery of certain supportive services, or the training or the, the placement and mentorship is, is a part of, of that too. No one organization can do that typically. So it needs to be spread among a, a good variety of, of partners. Um, and yeah, community-based organizations and, and workforce development boards, they have a great role to play in outreach uh, for pre-apprenticeship programs, like for the trades, where they're trying to increase the representation of of women while dealing with community-based organizations that, that focus on women. They've developed uh, uh, a sort of community uh, relationship with them and they're, they're trusted. They're, they're an invaluable uh, ally in that sense to a pre-apprenticeship partnerships. Um, CBOs and, and, uh, and uh, community colleges then also have a place in providing the actual training as well as the supportive services. So it's not always that a building trades council um, will be instructing folks in the MC3. That could be a CBO who's already developed that trust and those relationships in the community to do it, uh, that will be responsible for that. And oftentimes that works better than maybe if it was just the BTC providing, uh, the building trades council providing that, that training. Um, but in, in some way, the pre-apprenticeship partnership functions, functions in, a, in a similar way to the, the Joint Labour Management Committee, insofar as it's a place to solve logistical issues and to adapt the pre-apprenticeship program to the input of the employers. For example, they could say that the candidates were being sent, uh, they're, fi they're finding the, the work particularly physically arduous, so then maybe they might, the pre-apprenticeship program through the advisory committee will agree to add a uh, physical fitness side to their pre-apprenticeship training. Or it might be that they're failing the, the math test when they're, they're doing their apprenticeship application. And so then the advisory committee responds to that input and it, it develops uh, through a tie with a community college, maybe additional instruction in, in math so that they can pass those uh, exams. Um, so yeah, each, each partner has a, a unique value add, uh, when it comes to meeting the program objectives and it tends to be the more the merrier, you know, um, because oftentimes you'll get someone will, will raise an issue and because there's, you know, 25 heads in the room as part of the advisory committee, there's, there'll just so happen to be someone who has a, a pretty ingenious solution to it. Um, so yeah, we require certain core partners for that for that reason. I would, Pam, also the pre-apprentice programs also help on that calling side. And uh, uh, I, I saw um, my friend uh, Joyce Guy on here who comes out of the iron workers and is part of the West Oakland Job Center. And, and we used to, we had, before MC3, we were doing pre-apprentice work around a, uh, the Port of Oakland. And we would have folks who came in and I want to be a pile driver. Or I want to be in the building trades, but because um, it pays well, but I don't want to show up at 7 a.m. to work. I don't want to work outside. I don't like heights. So to be honest with you, a lot of folks, um, uh, it, the, the, the pre-apprentice programs are a way for them to, to understand that there aren't just plumbers, carpenters, and laborers, that there's... Um, you know, 27 odd different crafts or trades that they may be interested in and or to see um, uh, whether the, the, the work is something that they are uh, wanna actually do. I mean, in part, the, the trades got to that because so many folks were coming in and then leaving after the first year or two. So it's, it's not a screen out device, but it, it, it is a way both to introduce 
the, the work and the skills that are going to be required, but also to see if, if folks, again, are going to find this as a, a calling, if you will, um, around it. And I think that's one, one real important role that it can play in whatever um, sector it is in. Yeah, and if I can add to that, Pam, that's a, that's a really, really good point by John, is to, to make sure that it's not functioning like as a, like the, the folks who might be quote screened out because they find out that uh, they don't actually want to be in the trades after being instructed in the multi-craft core curriculum and finding out that, that none of these crafts are a good match for them or they're not particularly interested in it. Um, a good press practice is to have alternative pathways because there's always going to be a certain amount of people who either don't get into apprenticeship or they don't want to because they found out that it's just not for them. Um, so having all partners with community colleges or maybe having like a, a college credit for the MC3 allows for an alternative pathway into third level education if that's something they want or having other employers on that they might work in the utility sector separate from instruction but they're interested in, in hiring people from from these communities having them on as an alternative for the the pre-apprentice is a is a good be best practice great great so, and so connecting a, a variety of sort of pre pre hard skill programs uh, develop uh, would make sense and as as apprenticeship grows in other sectors uh, and maybe pre-apprenticeship in those sectors grows, building those networks and connections to support people um, once they make their determination about where they want to go would make some sense. So it's a nice segue, really. And it, and it says that, that building a career pathway starts even before apprenticeship, right, with pre-apprenticeship and that sort of development. So let's go ahead and move into that next topic of, of career pathway uh, and where apprenticeship really fits there. Um, and Rebecca, I think you've got a, a cool video that sort of helps us start to lay that out. I'm excited to be with you guys all today to celebrate our uh, first Thero Processing Tech Apprenticeship Program, and uh, more importantly, our graduates from that program. The process to getting the apprenticeship program started was huge. We had well over 500 to 600 applicants across the service area. We involved frontline staff, management, senior leadership, and the biggest part of the collaboration was the union, our labor partners. Without them, we could not have made this work. For the apprenticeship program, I was in the housekeeping department, EVS, for 20 years. I've been with Kaiser and I, I grew up with the company. Right. And sometimes the Leahy's might have four, and the Alice's have six. When I first met Reggie, uh, the first thing that came up to me was that he was uh, he was a go-getter, naturally. It was awesome working with Armando. I feel like I maximized my opportunity by having such a good preceptor. In this journey of training him, I really couldn't be my normal shy person. I kind of had to step out of my shell a little bit and, and uh, speak a little bit more, be more out there. It's a win for Kaiser because we stick to that model of caring about our employees and career progression. It's a win for the employee because they are able to stay here at Kaiser, but they are also enabled to progress and excel in their career. And for managers like me, it's a win because I get employees from other departments who have really good track records as employees and I have that opportunity to then groom them for roles in my department and progress them from there. I feel different in my new job, my new position. I feel empowered. I feel like by me taking the steps to further educate myself and better myself, this just expands you know, my horizons in the company to try something new, start a new career, open up a new path.
That's great. Thanks to the Ed Fund for sort of showing that. Rebecca, do you have some comments on how you guys think about this as, as in a career pathway context? Yeah, and I just want to uh, shout out to Scott Goodell, featured in that video. He really was the coordinator and driver of that program. Um, so, uh, you know, I think usually, you know, one, um, we think it is the right tool when there isn't another tool already in place that's successfully helping people move um, up the job ladder. And we know for incumbent workers, um, it's it's the right tool because um, for in healthcare, at least, I think only 10% of allied health workers have any kind of career path. And so it's really the exception, not the rule. And our program is really designed to kind of overcome those barriers. Um, I think Mark was talking earlier about, you know, really program design around removing barriers. So, um, so that's definitely, um, that's definitely sort of part of the why for us for apprenticeship and career paths. Um, that they don't happen without a significant OGT component. And so the model really suits well for that. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think in many cases where there isn't um, sort of a, a, a education solution because of the type of training that's needed when there isn't something already readily um, available, that um, it can be a way to partner with an industry or an employer around the specific training needs that are really going to allow people to advance in an accelerated way um, that isn't always possible if you're sort of going the more traditional CTE route um, that might not be sort of keeping up with how industry is growing and changing. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, and John, I know this is an issue uh, really dear to your heart. You want to talk to us about your thoughts on how this, how apprenticeship, what it means for career pathways, how to think about it? Sure. I mean, a, a couple of things. So um, one was um, an observation, which was in the 2008 recession, you know, we had the stimulus package and coming out of that, it seemed like half of the world was creating solar tech credentials um, jobs that were going to be the wave of the future. And you had um, a variety of of uh, entities, uh, community colleges, employers, and other kind of creating this. Um, and today those don't exist, um, frankly, as a job. But what does exist is um, those electrical uh, IPW NECA apprenticeships where that installation was, was embedded within a larger um, education and career pathway, um, if, if you will. And, I think the, the thing I really got out of that is, you know, all of the work that we are all doing, no matter what the occupation or the sector, we are constantly now having to engage and be adaptive and have change. And we saw it in everything coming out of, of COVID, but we're also seeing it in relationship to changes in the use of technology and incorporation of technology or, or um, climate change or whatever. And that that's going to continue to be um, the reality. And, and what the apprenticeship programs do is give folks a basic knowledge and skill set um, that then uh, uh, industry partnerships can build off of and add to and change over time. And, and I think that's the really important value of that piece. The other area that they have um, really good job at, and I think you heard it from, from Rebecca, um, is kind of dealing with uh, fixing some of the internal dead end job quality and job pathway pieces. And I, I kind of wanted to, if I could share this um, one example, again, from uh, uh, California Transit Works. Um, and this is at uh, Santa Clara Valley Transit Authority and ATU Amalgamated Transit Union 265. Um, at the start of their, their HRTP piece. And um, they have jobs in um, uh, overhead. They, were, they, they have a, um, a rail line system, they have a bus system, uh, and then they also have the maintenance division. And, and what they did was within this was over time, they've used HRTP and uh, uh, creating apprenticeships to basically take um, what were dead end jobs and create a lattice Kind of moving forward. Um, the bus uh, coach operator apprenticeship, which was the first of its kind in the United States, it's both um, DOL and DAS registered uh, in a partnership with Mission College, 
is kind of the entryway for a lot of new workers to come into the transit agency. Uh, the other area that you have um, a lot of folks coming in are service workers, folks cleaning uh, the buses and, and, and light rail pieces um, around it. And I, I will kind of move this, but the, the, the occupations in yellow were dead end occupations. Um, within the, the transit agency for folks. So folks kind of went into those and we're not really moving forward into to something else and particularly the, the uh, light rail station maintainer and, and facility worker, we're not moving up. They, they just couldn't acquire the skill sets or, or have the pathways kind of moving forward. And likewise, the track worker didn't have a relationship to the rest of the overhead line piece. So the apprenticeship programs, which are the um, junior track worker, the bus coach operator, the, the service mechanic, the overhead line uh, apprenticeship were ways to, to kind of build in that lattice. And you can also, um, at the top, you can also see that it goes back and forth uh, around that. And they, they eventually end up going into uh, management related positions over time. So folks learn um, both by being an apprentice and potentially being a mentor uh, there is that possibility in the long term to end up being a supervisor um, in 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 maintenance and or um, the operations side of things. So I just wanted to to kind of highlight the fact that one good area um, for for the apprenticeship programs is they really give you adaptability in delivering changes in skills and knowledge and abilities that the particular industry and employers may need because it gives you a, a, a foundation set of, of, of that to build off of. And then likewise, you can tie that into conversations around visiting the, the um, pathways and occupations that you've got in your institution. And again, not all of them like here or what you saw with Rebecca and in, in the occupations, there isn't like everything isn't an apprenticeship. It, 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 you don't have to shoot for that, but there may be really strategic places where that really makes some sense uh, in creating that, if you will. So that map is just such a great strategic and practical analysis that, that the transit uh, uh, team has put together. I think that's extraordinarily helpful in, in kind of figuring out from both of those perspectives how, how to think about this work in a particular sector or set of employers. That's great, John. Thank yeah. you. Um, could I, I could I put on the spot? I don't know if Russell. I saw Russell Anderson, who's um, one of the trainers and a former supervisor of VTA. If he had any sort of thoughts on apprenticeship and 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 this career ladder piece, I don't know if he's still there. <laughs> but given his experience, I did want to um, pull him into this if he had some thoughts. Russell, are you still there? <laughs> you can chew me out later. <laughs> Yeah, I'm still here, John. Thanks a lot for putting me on the spot. Uh, all, this, all the information I've heard is fantastic. The only thing I would add is that the labor management partnership, that piece is so important. And uh, a lot of times we wanna move past that. If that relationship is shaky, your program's gonna be shaky. If you can keep that part, keep that part really just pay attention to that labor management partnership and keep that going and keep those relationships up. It's so key. And then the other thing I would just add is that uh, running these programs, the mentors are the heart of the program. And so make sure you take care of your mentors, uh, find out what they need, keep them in power. Uh, the mentors, again, are the heart of these programs. So again, labor management partnership, keep that going and focus and make sure that your mentors are in power. Excellent. Thank you. We, we said it was going to be highly interactive. So thanks for letting us put you on the spot. If you no probably, we, yeah, absolutely, Russell, we appreciate it. VTA has been great. Mark, do you want to give us some thoughts around um, career, la career, la or career pathways in apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship? I think you're key there. Sure. Yeah. Um, so the traditional pathway into apprenticeship in the trades and this is reported mostly anecdotally but any i've met a lot of people who work in the trades and the vast majority of them ended up there because their their father was in the trade or their uncle was in the trade or their grandfather um so 
that person in their life helped to demystify this fairly Byzantine system where it's not always clear if they're hiring, when they're hiring, there's different hiring requirements for each trade and the application windows open at different times of the years. And it's, it's not always obvious where the resources are to interpret all of that stuff and, uh, and navigate your way through it. Um, so the, the, over time, the trades uh, began to notice they had a, a bit of a problem, which was that a lot of their workforce was due to uh, retire. Um, a lot of them were part of the quote unquote silver tsunami. And, you know, people who, who are due to require, retire in the next 10 years or so. Um, so they knew that they would need uh, extra workers. And the other issue that they were having is that the trades were not diverse. There was virtually no women, uh, very uh, few people of, of color, black people in particular. Um, so they needed a, a solution that addressed both of those problems. So the National Building Trades developed the multi-craft core curriculum. And part of the function that it was standing in for was uh, demystifying the trades for people who don't have any experience with them because of family connections or otherwise. As that was operationalized on the ground across the country, um, organizations who were running those programs found out that the curriculum isn't, isn't nearly enough. It's a really good start, but we have to address all of these other barriers if we're going to create a, a good career ladder into the trades. Um, and that's kind of what HRCC has, has emerged um, out of. So uh, yeah, that's, that's the end of what I have to say about that. That's, that's terrific. That's terrific. So we've hit the 11 o'clock hour. We're, we're, uh, you know, because of the wonderful interaction and a variety of great uh, information, we're a little behind time, but I think that's okay. Let's go ahead and jump into this last question then of when is apprenticeship the right tool? And then we'll start to really dive into your specific questions and call, call on each of you to ask your questions. Um, so, so this notion of, I think it's, it's, come up a couple of different times. Sometimes apprenticeship is, it makes sense. Uh, sometimes maybe it's not the right tool. Um, Rebecca, do you have some comments on that? Yeah, I will just say it's a lot of work. <laughs> and I actually really liked the point, I think it was Russell who said that like, you really need labor and management on board. And I would say that in our experience, if you don't have that, you should not be doing an apprenticeship program. Like that's so key for us. Um, we also would prefer to do it um, for a project where um, there's going to be an ongoing year over year commitment to continuing that um, program because the startup um, work is sort of the hardest. And then once it's going, um, it in theory could become more operationalized in a way that simplifies it and allows you to um, continue that pathway. And also the other reason for that is because so there's so much more interest, there's so much more supply than uh, demand than supply, if you will, for these opportunities, um, at least in our experience, like for every one slot, we might have several hundred applicants. And so I think the idea is like, you wanna make sure that it's gonna be an ongoing offering because otherwise people are gonna be really angry and upset and, and just like not get out of it what they need. Um, and then I think, um, like I said, I think it's also like where you don't already have a good solution. Like there's not an existing simpler um, training solution. And then finally, I'll just give one more highlight, even though we do do competency-based, I think where the, sh the length of the program doesn't really warrant a full-blown apprenticeship program. So for example, we've done medical assisting apprenticeship in the past. Um, in lots of earn and learn style medical assisting training programs. And I think in the end, we really see medical assisting, like it just doesn't warrant a full-blown apprenticeship in our minds because it could be done as a pre-apprenticeship almost, right? For ongoing career advancement. And then if you could figure out the MA to RN or MA to LVN, like those would be good apprenticeship programs. But I think from our perspective, some of the um, more entry-level clinical roles are really good sort of pre-apprenticeship opportunities, if that makes sense. Yep, no, those are some, some really great rules of thumb or, or things to think about as folks consider whether or not to develop for a particular project. 
and John, I know you've, I'm sure you've got some thoughts on this and there are also perspectives on um, uh, how to scale up apprenticeship programs and bring them down and make sure that they're not oversaturating the market and all kinds of things. So love to hear your thoughts on this piece. Well, I mean, I think the big thing to remind and it may be uh, something to consider as to whether you do an apprenticeship or not is it really is based on demand. Um, uh, Again, to go back to the recession, um, the building trades construction apprentice programs were not being offered. It's not like, you know, there's another semester coming up and our goal is to get 25 bucks in the seats. They basically stopped um, uh, operating. And, and as Rebecca probably has to make the calculation, those apprentice programs are generally figuring out how much work what's the demand going forward for their current apprentices, their current journey level workers, and then on top of that, how many new apprentices can we take? So um, you do really have to have an idea of sort of what the, the industry need and, and, and demand are to figure out whether um, that's important or not. I do think that, that one opportunity potentially of apprenticeship, again, as you see um, in the building trade side, and maybe, I don't know, in, in Rebecca's, and we're, we're seeing it a little bit in the transit side, is we know sort of what the overall beyond just one employer is, that it's a way to sort of create an industry-valued um, supply of skilled labor to meet that overall industry demand. And I, I do think that's um, to the extent that, that um, the state and, and our HRTPs are moving forward in that end, that's the real opportunity. As, as Rebecca said, it's, it's also a lot of time and energy in that equation. But, um, you know, when you look at a, a, a electrical workers and contractor association, all of those contractors, electrical contractors are actually all small businesses. They all would qualify under a state or a federal small business definition, but that system creates a labor pool of highly skilled workers that uses a labor exchange to, to move forward. Um, we're trying in the transit end, again, um, having big changes going on uh, between now and 2040, where every public transit agency has to get to having zero emission buses. And the, the skill requirement for that, even for uh, existing uh, mechanics is going to be huge. The work that folks like Russell and others are doing by trying to create those apprentice and pre-apprentice programs, in addition to the mentoring and the partnership pieces, is one way for particularly um, those institutions and their partnerships to, to actually get to having uh, a maintenance um, fleet uh, of workers um, come 2040, if not now, as they're buying these these buses going forward. So um, some things to think about. The other thing I just wanted to add really quick is if you're thinking about doing this too, and I know a lot of us are driven by both our own desire and by state and other mandates around bringing in new hires and access and, and all of that, you also have to figure out and consider what the reaction is of incumbent workers is to something and whether they're going to have access to it. Um, I, again, I think we you, you've seen both with Rebecca's example. I know another in manufacturing, there's a industrial manufacturing technician apprenticeship that's used elsewhere to take incumbent workers and move them up. You will have jealousy and some opposition if you're only creating something for new folks and there aren't steam opportunities for those folks that are already there. Um, so that's just also something to really consider in this equation too. That's that's really helpful, sure. And there are some questions starting to emerge in the chat that we'll, we'll get to in the general, but around what do you do when there isn't a, 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 an organized a union, set of unions in your sector, and how do you think about that and putting these together? Um, you know, what does that mean for when apprenticeship makes sense and when it doesn't, all those kinds of things. So great. Thanks, John. And we'll be getting to some of those additional questions. Um, Mark, do you have some thoughts on, on uh, how we should think about from the pre-apprenticeship perspective, when to do this, when not to? Uh, yeah, I, I just second what John said about um, demand uh, and understanding if that demand is there involves engaging the 
the employers from the very beginning. Um, the, the building trades are their history in California. They didn't always do that with uh, employers. Um, their arm was kind of twisted when the employers began to seek alternatives. But eventually it, it, uh, it ended up in, in you know, labor management committees where they, they can uh, respond to the concerns of the employers and what they, what they want. Um, with pre-apprenticeship, if the demand is for uh, women, for example, and they're just struggling to recruit for that position, uh, or if the demand is for, for people of color or veterans or formerly incarcerated, then that it would, would be a good place to uh, consider developing some kind of pre-apprenticeship structure that engages those populations and meets the, the needs and helps to, to get rid of the barriers in their way. Um, but yeah, John and Rebecca made some excellent points, but that's all I'd add to that. Great. So consider job quality, consider demand and availability, because I would imagine one of the worst things you can do is, is build up, tra train a bunch of people or support a bunch of people in getting ready for jobs that aren't there, right? Yeah, so yeah. Really and about... the pre-apprenticeship programs have, have learned that the hard way here too. There's been some... Um, public relations issues with, for example, the, the construction of the Golden One Arena here in Sacramento and uh, not managing expectations uh, enough about how many apprenticeship slots something like that will result in. Um, so making sure that you have your, your finger on the pulse of demand by having those industrial partners on the advisory committee and keeping in touch with them about what their projections are for the amount of people that they'll need. And um, all of that stuff is, is very, very important. And potentially leveraging things like community benefits agreements to, to start to identify those numbers and commitments on the front end. It, does that make sense as well? And, and maybe fund yeah. projects too. Yeah, exactly. That's the, that's the most common uh, demand side intervention there. Um, and it will be defined in the community benefits agreement or community workforce agreement or whatever you want to call it. Um, the percentage of the workers from what particular it could be from a zip code it could be from uh it could be from a, a, a demographic um but all of that will be defined and the contractors will work with the trades will work with the community-based organizations who are training these people and making sure that those those numbers are met it can be a, a tricky process but it works a lot of the time <laughs> great great all right thank you well let's go ahead and get to the to the the promised general Q&A session. I'm going to ask Andrew Yeager, our uh, graduate student researcher, to um, look back through the chat and and start with those questions up front. I think I think there were some up front around mentorship, particularly. Thanks, Pam. Yeah. Uh, so the first one I'm, I flagged here was uh, from Michael Kushner, um, and I guess I'd just ask Michael ask Michael to uh, to expand on his question here uh, and restate it for the panel. Sure. Hi. Um, we're in the process of getting ready to launch an apprenticeship and clearly, you know, training mentors or preceptors is going to be a key part of, you know, whether that succeeds. And I'm just curious, uh, what are the elements uh, of a, a mentor training that others have used successfully and how have they delivered it? I'm, I'm getting, well, I don't know if you want it from us, but I will, because you might know what we do, but I will um, kick it to, um, to Maggie, and if Scott is on, I know Scott actually, I don't know if Scott Goodell, you wanna jump on here, but um, we've used a curriculum from HCAP and I saw Susie was asking about that too. We've used the, the curriculum from HCAP and I, Scott, I know has a lot of experience in sort of creating, um, you know, delivery of that. We've done it both online and in person, but Maggie can just speak to the elements of it. And Scott probably could do, but yeah. Sure, yeah, I'll just get started. And um, a big, again, shout out to Scott, who actually did this work and was the leader. So as she mentioned, we had this curriculum from HCAP. Then we hired um, outside instructors that were able to take that curriculum and to customize it to the exact apprenticeship that we are doing. And so <clears throat> for our stale processing one, when it was in person, it was two eight-hour days with a four-hour follow-up um, after one month. And then they had to switch to online. So they did three four-hour days with a four-hour follow-up one month later. So that's how they kind of adjusted with COVID when they needed to go online. And some of the principles of the training, like the areas of study, 
Um, a big focus is even just the power of mentorship and what does that mean to be a mentor? Um, if even because that's like a new concept for people of what it means to be a mentor. A lot is spent on the principles of adult learning, cultural competence, awareness, sensitivity, and humility. And then a lot of time is spent on communication and problem solving strategies. So I think it also helps that there's a cohort that they're like learning together. And so um, one of the areas with our mentorship is we've talked about is do we make it customizable per apprenticeship that we're doing this, or do we ever take out the mentorship training and have it separately? So that's an area that we sometimes are talking about, but that's kind of an overview of the mentorship. And I don't know if Scott wanted to add any of that because that was the work, the great work that he did. Um, this is Elizabeth. Hey, Maggie. Um, hey, uh, Scott hi, is, Michael. Uh, <laughs> um, Scott was on the call. Um, he's actually not available right now. He's at a doctor's appointment. Um, but um, uh, but Scott and Michael can connect uh, offline, obviously. Excellent. And I think that um, HCAP curriculum is available online too. We can I, don't know, I can try to look for it and drop it in the chat. That's great. And uh, VTA and others have some terrific mentorship programs. Is there anybody else who wants to jump in on their on how they do a ment mentorship, how they train mentors? We do love to put people on the spot. Okay, let's go ahead and jump to the next question. Andrew, what you got? All right, so the next question I flagged, there were two questions about this, a tough one, I think, um, but important. So what about, well, let's, I believe it was Michael uh, Bell that asked this uh, first. Would you like to expand on your question about uh, organizing and manufacturing? Yeah, hello. Oh, um, <clears throat> I'm with the couple organizations. We have a high roads through the California Mobility Center for Transportation in Sacramento. Uh, we have a partnership with the organization called SVMA, Sacramento Valley Manufacturing Alliance. Um, and we are developing an apprenticeship program with employer partners with a variety of manufacturing occupations, uh, machinists, precision welder, some products manufacturer, et cetera. And so as we develop and identify these new occupations, it's all around the specific pathway, but all within manufacturing. Every single one of those don't have a union uh, in, the, in the Sacramento region. Um, and we've identified an alternative approach to leverage a group of community-based organizations um, to represent uh, workers in this context. Um, but I was just wondering what alternative approaches are there to incorporate worker voice uh, in the context of an apprenticeship program that's industry-led, that doesn't have a union? R really great question, Michael, uh, and challenging one. John, do you have any comments or does anybody, I don't, ways to, ways to think about this? I don't, I mean, I think um, the long-term um, question will be particularly around job quality, I think, uh, and, and elements of that, because um, uh, uh, one thing I, 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 I would articulate that um, as a reminder to folks is that labor often not just represents the supply side, meaning the workers, it also brings the demand side. So to the extent that, um, uh, your, your, um, you, you further benefit from industry knowledge and, and understanding industry demand. Um, it is also possible to have uh, uh, apprentice programs that have both union and non-union employers and have labor involved in them. So there is the possibility for, for creating that. It doesn't have to be even necessarily an either or. So, so that would that lead to the notion that the folks that are working in sa the Sacramento uh, area could partner uh, to develop these programs and make uh, make them portable and work with um, uh, similar manufacturing programs in other parts of the state where there where there are unions. Is that what you're saying? There may be uh, an opportunity for some connection. Yeah, or even even locally. So you'll you'll have both unilateral and joint and, and then also plant apprenticeships. So um, uh, there, there may be a, a variety of, of uh, locations where those apprenticeships take place. They may be specific to an employer um, that could be union or non, um, in addition to having a, a, a larger 
piece of the um, manufacturing sector that they're working in or sectors that may have um, a variety of kind of sub partnerships, if you will, within that piece. Within that piece. And Michael, I remember in a previous conversation that we had that you had spoken about some committees that you're putting together and also some commitments that you're getting for employers for particular um, salary ranges and job quality measures along the pathways that you're developing. Do, do you want to comment on that to the group? Yeah, we've got each occupation has its own committee of industry partners that dictate the work process schedule and um, and RSI. Uh, but then um, one of the other uh, committees we were developing is uh, we're calling supportive services, or that's a community-based organizations that um, represent um, a connection between uh, apprentices and um, and occupation that they're committed to. Uh, we did talk about having a separate committee uh, altogether, just representing apprentices, um, but that was our admin uh, committee uh, advocated against that. Um, by itself without having a structured, essentially it would be a union um, created by the apprentices, but uh, the trick is um, how to create one that represents all occupations and not just a very narrow. So that's the, that's the unique challenge and benefit of manufacturing Sacramento region that is not dominated by one single type of occupation or industry. Um, it's a really diverse mixture of all kinds of occupations and industries. Um, and, and we're trying to create a single structure that captures all that. And we've got that in place, um, but we're missing, I think, uh, emphasis on worker voice. I think we have a solution, like I said, through our community-based organizations, but um, I'm just wondering if there's other examples of that. Um, Cause we don't have it even, there are union apprentices or union um, workers for warehouse personnel or production like assembler personnel. Um, but when we start talking about the uh, uh, the more lucrative occupations like machinists, precision welding, that doesn't exist outside of construction. So, okay. So and, I would invite oh, go Sacramento. Ahead. I'll, I'll look across the state and I'll look. I got contacts in uh, Michigan through um, SME, other professional organizations that could help um, uh, kind of tie that piece together. Great. So I would the just invite. I, people. I would say is there are. Um, uh, there are unions in every sector of California manufacturing and in, in just about every occupation. So they, they do exist here in California. So. so if you could help make some connections, if as, as Michael and his team start to explore that, I would invite folks to, to sort of help. We can get together and kind of help think about how we could create some of those connections. Is there a database where that exists, that information? John's head. <laughs> Mine and Casey, we can, we'd can. we be happy to have a conversation with you, Michael. That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Andrew, what's up next? Um, well, I noticed that Joyce uh, Guy had a question earlier. I, I don't know if it was sufficiently answered. Joyce, did you, did you still want to answer that or ask that one? Uh, no, it was answered efficiently. Thank you guys very much. Great, great. Thanks, Joyce. Um, well, I'm not seeing any other new questions here. Um, we did prepare some questions beforehand, and I thought maybe I would throw one out about policy, which we haven't talked too much about today. Um, so we're wondering if any of you all, uh, any of the HRTPs we're discussing today are developing, um, you know, have, have thought about policy approaches to advancing apprenticeship standards. Right, like things like requiring certifications that can be a, 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 a achieved uh, and working with state policymakers on this. Um, I think we're, meaning the State Labor Federation, um, we are gonna take a look at um, AB 235 that established the non-traditional apprenticeship. I think the struggle that California has is, is several fold. One is that, um, we have a goal that the governor has laid out, but it's not based at all on sort of um, what the demand is um, in, in any particular sector and how, how they will get to that 500,000 apprentices um, goal that, that the state has, whether that's in manufacturing or healthcare or the public sector or 
transportation or you know whatever it is there isn't some larger strategic plan if you will um, laid out there likewise i think one of the things that um we are thinking about is in a lot of ways there aren't the kind of standards in um codes and regulations that you have in traditional apprenticeships so we've pushed um, in partnership with Rebecca and others within the uh, Interagency Committee on Apprenticeship for establishing things like minimum industry training criteria. Um, there's a lot of work that probably needs to be done, frankly, on establishing or even just writing really good work standards and work processes in non-traditional apprenticeship and having those mean something. Again, the goal of this is to have apprenticeships that have industry value um uh for for both the employers and uh the apprentices and and there's also a need frankly for more transparency uh around sort of what apprenticeship is and and what the opportunities there and i always kind of approach when i look at the state and others like as a parent it's like frankly if i've got one of my kids and um you know we've all pushed this four-year college piece that obviously given student debt and everything else kept people have come to the realization that that's not the sole way to go that we would like more earn and learn strategies in the equation but how do you find out about good apprentice programs and so getting more investment frankly in in highlighting ones that work like rebecca's uh, are the kinds of things that i think the state and, and policymakers should be doing doing more promotion of and, and lifting up that's really helpful. Anybody else on policy uh, around standards or around CBAs or? The only thing I'll add, which is a little bit specific to healthcare, but I think, you know, it, it's probably generalizable, if that's a word, to, um, uh, you know, industries where um, there's a history of unpaid clinical training um, is that we, um, it's sitting on the governor's desk, I think unsigned still, but um, passed unanimously in the Senate and the assembly, like the um, AB 1273, which removes um, what's actually, an, um, which requires accrediting agencies um, or those overseeing accrediting agencies to allow for the possibility of earn and learn because it's actually prohibited um, in, in a lot of healthcare licensing and accreditation boards. Um, so there's just some things like that that we're continuing to change um, policy-wise, um, and, and the community colleges oppose that um, and uh, have opposed that historically, you know, changes in, in having paid clinical time. Um, so I think just figuring out um, how we um, remove and, and sort of legislate re removing all the kind of barriers there are um, to earn and learn opportunities and sort of, and it goes to equity, right? Since um, certain industries and occupations that tend to be um, represented by women and, and workers of color, like often have this sort of unpaid um, clinical or OJT component. Um, so I think policies that address that. Great. And does that include, uh, and would you also think about staffing levels as, as a policy approach? Not that it directly is apprenticeship, but the, you know, if people staffed appropriately, there are more opportunities for folks to move through a career ladder move up. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I would, I would say, um, you know, especially around scope of practice issues in healthcare, at least it's sort of like, um, there's a lot there, right? but like, uh, because I think, you know, yeah like staffing requirements. Um, there's a lot of going on right now, obviously with the healthcare workforce in the face of the pandemic, like a lot of burnout, a lot of like real struggle, right? Like people who've been through a lot and are burnt out and like one in three workers in healthcare are considering leaving the industry or have already left. And I think um, for, um, for folks, I think that they like, um, they're really upset about the staffing. And that's a huge issue right now in our industry. Like our membership is sort of like, it's like, I would argue maybe one of the number one issues that they're, that they're, that they're talking about is just like um, the intensity of understaffing. I know there was an effort by the California Hospital Association to get the state to cover like 
you know, expenses up to $300 an hour for travel nurses and things like that. So I think there's like, there's so much happening in terms of, yeah, the labor supply <laughs> to your point, Pam. And, um, and I think there's been, you know, requests to extend, um, you know, the, the relaxing of staffing requirements for nurses and there are not staffing requirements for other positions we support. So I don't know. I mean, there's a lot there to unpack, but I would say it's, I don't, I haven't thought about, I think what I'm more interested in is sort of like thinking about the future of care, the care team. And like one of the things we were talking to um, a union partner about was like creating um, care teams to address um, like emergency room staffing related to um, mental health crises. Um, and changing the way that's approached instead of a police model, like having a model of having, you know, um, a psych tech, a social worker and a psychiatric nurse, like working in a team. And so I just think there's, to your point, there's like new models and, and questions around scope of practice, questions about how we're training people up, because even for that program we're looking at, there isn't an existing psych tech program already in that region that we can utilize for that. So then we have to like problem solve and figure out where we're going to get this education from. So anyway. I'll stop there, but I think there's a lot there and I'm less interested in like requirements of certain staffing is to develop really successful staffing models that have better outcomes for patients, better outcomes for workers, and better outcomes for employers too, I guess. Employers. So that's really helpful and, and creative ways that other people can then translate to their sectors and think how, you know, to sort of, how are you thinking about this? That's, I appreciate that. Andrew, did Dr. Yanez have a question? Are we? Yes, I'm very sorry. I missed Dr. No, you're good. question. I also miss Susie also had a question about me uh, membership, uh, mentorship. Great. I'm sorry. Uh, if, if we still have time, I'm, I'd love to hear these questions. So we're over time. If, if folks can hang uh, for those last two questions, uh, please do. Uh, I don't know if our panelists can. Panelists can, getting some nods. Dr. Yanez, are you still on? Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So just really quickly, um, I, I wanted to know if anybody has uh, pitched an idea to an HR director, having students maybe work Monday through Thursday and then go to class Friday and Saturday, just you know, so that they get exposed to every department and then not get burnt out from you know, a regular uh, position. That's my question. Perfect. Anybody got have some experience in that? Yeah, I wanted to just um, bump Tariq if I could. Um, Tariq, oh, he just went off screen. Hopefully, oh, he might have to leave. You have to yeah. leave. <laughs> Sorry. I do in just a second. Okay, okay. Um, Can you just talk quickly about sort of the approach we took with HRTP 1.0? We, we did um, a program where yes. we kind of, um, it wasn't a pre-apprenticeship formally, but but it was sort of a pre-apprentice type program. It in, did include some English language and it also um, yeah. exposed people to different jobs. But mostly the reason I wanted to tap you, Tariq, is because I remember we wanted people to do job shadowing and we ended up instead structuring it around having someone come in. And can you explain the reason? Because I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that the initial iteration of High Road to Healthcare Careers had all the elements of a pre-apprenticeship, but the key element of the linkage to an actual apprenticeship, which we all know is, is a requirement for pre-apprenticeship. But what we did was we provided support to um, janitorial and food service staff who are interested in moving into clinical roles. And we gave instruction to them on two days a week, so on Tuesday and Thursday mornings for about four hours, and they were paid for their time while they had some time off of their shifts uh, to be able to participate in this program. And we exposed them to the healthcare industry, a lot of academic skills, a lot of kind of teamwork, interpersonal um, and critical thinking skills. And what Rebecca was pointing to is we initially had big plans to do very robust job shadowing, but we essentially had to settle on field trips to various facilities and kind of like a mini career fair where folks from different departments would come in and explain the nuts and bolts of each of their positions. And uh, we were talking about this with pre-apprenticeship earlier, that early exposure to what the positions entail um, is critical because sometimes folks have perceptions or misperceptions about the work and being able to hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, really gives them an idea of what they would be going into if they ended up pursuing um, that job. Excellent. 
Thank you. And I think all your programs, you've negotiated uh, time off for folks to do this work. So work, you've, you've all worked really, really closely with your HR departments to, to, to create that whatever kind of support was necessary, whether it's this kind of shadowing thing or, or whatever kind of time off was necessary. Okay. I know there's a whole lot. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Yanez. I know there's a whole lot more discussion we could do. Um, we, we're five minutes over time, so I guess we better res be respectful of folks' time and, and cut it off there. Let me invite um, you all to either leave comments in the chat. Uh, we'll leave the call open for the next few minutes about what more on apprenticeship you'd like to hear. Um, and, and also email uh, me with uh, additional questions because this, this clearly is a conversation that um, should continue um, over time. So any ideas, conversations, or requests, uh, let us know. Uh, we hope we got as many questions answered as possible and, and we'll just keep this conversation going in future. Great. And thanks especially to our panelists and to our great graduate student researchers and to all of you for your expertise. Thanks you thanks to you all. You made it a great, a great hour and a half plus. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.